Welcome, world, to the CNET stage at CES 2020. We are broadcasting live from Tech West at the Sands Expo Center in Las Vegas, part of the massive annual gathering of gadgetry that is the largest consumer tech show, CES. It is the second day of the show. We have had quite the eventful day yesterday, and to recap it all, we are kicking it off with our morning news show. I'm Bridget Carey. I'm Roger Chang. And this is your Daily Charge. All right, so I want to talk about something we seemingly have been talking about this entire show, and that is Neon. It's like the super hype thing that like, started before we even got here. Exactly. This Samsung-funded startup teased little nuggets before the show and then had this really kind of nondescript booth, SES, unveiled a couple days ago, seemingly at this point two weeks ago. And now uh, and we now finally we get to see it. Exactly. We actually got uh, hands-on or, I guess, FaceTime with, <laughs> with one of these so-called neons, these artificial humans. Yeah, these are not uh, assistants like your Alexa or Siri. These are – that's not a real person. That's not a real dude. Are, that's yeah, all computer. Exactly. These are all CG-created people. You interact with them through these digital displays. There are no, like, actual physical humans or robots I or anything like, like that. I feel like it's a chat bot with video. Kind like, of. Yeah, and, 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 and it's meant to look real, right? Yes, and it, it, but it's not supposed to be a voice assistant. It's not supposed to be an Alexa or, or a Bixby in Samsung's case. Uh, it doesn't really answer a lot of – it won't answer your questions, but it will interact with you in a, in a kind of limited way. There was a huge amount of hype about this, particularly because these initial shots showed CG-created humans that seemed so, so lifelike that it was kind of indistinguishable. But our own Andrew Gebhardt actually got a chance to interact with one, and Seeing the video footage of that interaction. This is this is the this real interaction. Like Look at her. She's a little stiff. She's it, a little stiff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and like it, it. So it's not quite there yet. In and that, like, oh, I'm fooled. And Andrew had a couple of questions he asked. You know, uh, just sort of basic questions. Yes, like, what was your favorite food? She goes pizza. Pizza. And then right. it, it also sounded a little. And there off, was one you know? question that he asked that I guess she couldn't figure out. And then like after a really awkward pause, it was like. My neurons are burning, well, right? Well, he, he asked, like, do you like football? She said, no. Oh, right, and right. he's like, why not? And then it was like, I can't compute. Why not? I right. don't like football. <laughs> right. And I think that was, that, and that was an intentional question. That was really smart of Andrew because he wanted to see if the AI or the artificial human could build upon the conversation, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, you, why don't you like football? That's a, a second step. That's something that voice assistants are working on now or, mm -hmm. the, or have started to roll out, right? And so it's clear that this is, not quite ready for prime time. And, and, and that's important to point out because everything we've seen so far is already pre-rendered animation. Yep. Yep. So uh, potential is there. Um, and then where would you use this kind of stuff? And, and it, it does pose a lot of worrisome questions about will these kinds of applications, if they get smooth enough, yeah. will they be fooling us? Like if you want to go check into your hotel or watch a video on your phone, will you know if that's a computer person or a real person? You know. Right. So this is very interesting stuff. Well, and and uh, I mean, it's a little bit awkward stuff. And our own Charles Tipkin had a, our, the first interview actually with the CEO of Neon. Mm -hmm. And you know, he talked a bit about how th these aren't supposed to rep uh, replicate Actual humans. Well, well not supposed to. Not supposed to. I mean, I think they uh, want it to be as good as they can he, make he it. But he did say that, that, that this was the application that, like, eventually this could replace a bank teller or, scarily enough, it replace an actual teacher. Do I need that? I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, I, I, I don't need a fake, you know, like, fake me out kind of person. But it's, right. it, it, it's interesting. And Samsung does a lot of experimental stuff um, at their booth. David Katzmeyer got to check out some of the weirder side. Like you always hear about the common gadgets, but there's a lot. There, there's always a weirder side to CES booths, and one of them was something that also gave me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies. Robot I arms in the kitchen. It's a robot okay. arm cook. Okay. I don't know if we could play some of the video for it. These gangle arms dangle from your cabinet. Oh my gosh! And we have now comfortable enough with robots that we have given them knives, ladies and gentlemen. These Just robots are cutting your food. Just to be clear, <laughs> I'm not comfortable <laughs> with a robot arm holding a knife in my kitchen. And they're also reaching for things. You know, this one was making a salad. But yeah, um, a little bit frightening. I'm not, yep, they're, yeah, don't want to give robots knives, but here we are at CES doing it. This is, this is more of a concept, right? Yes, this and is it, it is yeah. a concept. Yeah. Uh, but 
Uh, it, it just goes to show you that there's always a little bit of weird at CES, and it just had me going, I can't believe. You know, it, it definitely... Like, we, we, like, try so hard for the robot assistants to be friendly and bubbly and right. cute. And, like, look, it has cute little eyes, and it's so small. Like, <laughs> the other one, the ball, the ball. You can just kick that thing. But, no, now they're just, you know, getting... And it does surprise me how fast we've gotten to the point where we are okay with robots with weapons <laughs> as a thing that we show off that we're proud of. Hey, check out our knife-wielding robot arm. Oh, man. So, yeah, yeah. But that wasn't the only thing that um, really, like, got my attention because Toyota, if you want to yes. talk about this a little bit, the, um, uh, you know, we it, there's very few times you think about technology really changing things up. I mean, tell us about what Toyota, what, what, uh, the Woven City, right? Yes, so Toyota Woven City, it's this interesting concept. They've got like 150-odd acres of land by Mount Fuji. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some video of this, actually. And this idea is that they want to create this, uh, this test city, the city as a test bed for smart city infrastructure, for autonomous vehicles. The funny thing is that you know, they want to divide this into three sections, one for autonomous vehicles, one for kind of light, very small uh, vehicles, personal uh, yeah, mobile relocation vehicles, and then one that's like no vehicles at all, which is funny because it's coming from one of the biggest car makers in the world. No actual real cars are actually going to be in this smart city. But they have, they have looked at the problem of how do you make transportation of the future, and they said, you yeah. know what? We have to just make our own city. Exactly. And, and the infrastructure is also underground. Deliveries, there's a whole like network of, of uh, transportation that will be going on underground to just pop up a yep. at, at your home to like give you your, your, your mail. Um, it's quite fascinating because the other day when, when Hyundai was talking about, yep. oh, yeah, in the future, we'll just have self-driving cars everywhere. We're all talking on stage going, where's the infrastructure for that? Right, right. And, and you need to just bulldoze a city. And lo and behold, here is Toyota going, hey, we're just going to make our own city, which is a little frightening that we yep. need companies to change the future city. And do you really want to live in a company city? I would like, I, I hope it inspires actual governments to change things around. But it's, it, it is just one of those moments where you're kind of like watching this going, whoa. No, totally. And this, this city is fascinating. This is Hyundai's like, like concept that they were had where like, yes, where like the they uh, were working with Uber for transportation in the air right. and, and all these pods. But yeah, it's like, where is that going? And I, I want to talk a bit about the smart city again because they do expect real people to move in and like set up communities there. Yeah, real but people. there are sensors everywhere. And so you're basically looking... They, they want people to be willing to live in, an, in a city that will be tracking their mo movements and tracking mm -hmm. everything. Kind of a, a Truman show S type environment, really. Yeah, so. like, this is still Hyundai stuff here, but, yeah, oh yeah like, there we go. like, like I, don't, I didn't see the, like, it, it's cool, but, yeah. like, but, like, I didn't see where that could practically go, you know, right. and, right. Um, man, uh, having a company do a city, like, I, I've often, like, it was funny, the, the, even the Toyota presentation was, like, are you guys thinking I'm crazy? He was making, he was cracking a bunch of jokes because <laughs> he knew what it sounded like. Um, right. You know, am I like the Willy Wonka here? And uh, I really found it a little refreshing and I hope it's in the positive direction. But yeah, once again, here we are with a corporation right. really having to change things up and, well, what, and, what, and what impact will that have? Uh, well, I think this is the value of CES though. Like these kinds of announcements, these kinds of projects, they're mm -hmm. ambitious, they're bold. They really set us on a path for the next couple of years and sort of gives us some direction, some line of sight into what things might look like in the next couple of years. And that's why I like CES. It's not just the gadgets we see today. Mm -hmm. It's the, the vision, the strategy for the future that's really exciting. Yeah, we always talk about the, the world of tomorrow and uh, it, sometimes it takes something different to really make a change. Yeah. And, and we need it. And we need it in this world with, with, with the environmental concerns we have. So. Absolutely. Well, I want to take a quick break right now, but we're going to be back with guests to talk about smart locks. We're not done with the Daily Charge. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Daily Charge. Joining us on the stage now is Kate Clark with Yale and Jason Johnson with August. Thank you guys for coming by and showing us the new smart locks. Good to be here. Good morning. Good to be here. So, yeah, let's so show us. You've got some products. You've got some goodies here. Why don't you show us what, what's new with August and with Yale? Mm -hmm. We will do that. So, I think many of, many of your viewers, your, your readers are familiar with the August smart lock. We've been mm -hmm. shipping for about six years now. This is the uh, third generation August Smart Lock, very popular, about the most popular Smart Lock in North America. 
Uh, it's, you know, it's a nice size. It's kind of like a large doorknob. Uh, and we love this product. However, quite a few uh, customers and interior designers, architects have asked us to make it smaller. And we've been working on that. And this is the fourth generation August Smart Lock. Ah, it's about 40% smaller. smaller. Mm -hmm. So I'll put these side by side. You can see the comparison with uh, the third generation. In addition to smaller, we also added Wi-Fi. So now it has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in the lock. You don't need an external little Bluetooth to Wi-Fi bridge anymore. It's, it's in the lock, all in one. So it's easier setup, essentially. Very quick, easy setup. Got it. Got it. And then we've got uh, another product, Kate. Okay, what, what, what have we got here? Yeah, I'm delighted to say uh, we finally launched a lock into Europe. So this okay. is the uh, Yale Linus lock. Can so I take a look at it? Absolutely. This right, is a, me, the first the, uh, uh, smart door lock from us. This thing is pretty hefty, by the absolutely, way. Absolutely, it yeah. It's, it's heavy. It's made of aluminium, um, beautifully designed by Yves Bahar, who designs all of the August products. Uh, and this product is compatible across all of Europe. So and that's an that's impressive feat, right? Because they're, they're not standard across Europe. But tell me about some of the difficulties of like, designing a lock that actually fits on every single door uh, in Europe. Yeah, so locks yeah, are too. very, very oh, different yeah. in yeah. Europe. Oh, yeah. um, you have different standards. Mm -hmm. They actually sit on the door in different ways. In some geographies, doors, in fact, open outwards. So in Scandinavia, doors open outwards instead of inwards. Mm. They also sit above the handle, and then in some geographies, they sit below. Um, so what we've managed to do with this product, um, our engineering teams, as, as the world's leader in locks, is that we've actually designed something that will work across multiple geographies, not compromising on security at all. Um, and basically, um, it comes with all the great features that you would expect. But on the back, we have different adapters. So if you live in mainland Europe, it will work with Euro profile. Oh, I see. Um, if you live in my country, that will work, but also we have the Oval for Finland uh, and other countries. Um, the main difference, though, is, is around torque, because basically in some places like, like Turkey, you have to turn the lock three times, which is oh, a wow. lot, right, to throw the bolts. So um, that's why it's that size, because we've, we've got a lot of power in, in the product. Gotcha. Very powerful. Uh, so I'd be remiss not to, to talk a bit about privacy, obviously it's smart home, well, it's a big topic here yeah, at the there's, show. There's yeah. been a lot of talk about uh, smart homes. Ring has been in the headlines over the last few, uh, last year or so about some of the work they've done. Uh, I'm just curious, how, how do, as a company, how do you view privacy and so what, what sort of resources do you put behind ensuring these things are actually you know, safe from hackers? Sure, so absolutely. So, so August you know, has been shipping smart locks for about six years now. And we've always adopted a philosophy that your data is yours. Like we don't, we don't want to mine your data. We don't sell data. All we make is smart locks. None of it's shared to third parties. Never, never, never has been shared. Every 30 days, we purge your personal data. Now with GDPR requirements, and now that we're part of Yale and this very large global company, yes, uh, we now are GDPR compliant. So anybody can go purge their data anytime. And, and the good thing is, is that our parent company, um, you know, Yale is the biggest lock brand in the world. Uh, they've there's the same philosophy. We're in the business of locks. We don't sell advertising. We don't sell other products. This is what we do. And so privacy is, and trust building is number one for us. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, for 180 years, we've been making locks. Right. Our business model is very simple. It's all about security. And so we want to give you the best experience. And, and there's, a, there's always a blend between convenience and security. But that's our paramount, is that we want the product to be secure. And it's a and for you to work it in whichever way you want. And we're very clear on that. When we're going into the new year and here at CES and you're hearing about the trends that, that, that are going on in smart home systems, especially locks, what has your attention? What is your um, focus on going into the next year for where the industry is heading mm -hmm. and the changes that you may be concerned about or just thinking about and having conversations about? Well, I think it's safe to say, and again, CNET's done a great job talking about this, that the real challenge for consumers adopting new technologies like this is making sure that if they buy something, that it's going to work with the other things in their house. Mm. Their smart lighting, their smart thermostats, their speakers. And so the, the burden is on us in the industry that make these devices to make sure that it's easy to interoperate and, and easy for the consumers to know that they're, they're, if they put something like this on their door, it might stay there for five, ten years. They want to know it's going to work with everything for a while. And, you know, We've always taken a very neutral, or I should say Switzerland type approach to work with everybody. You know, so we work with Google and Amazon and Apple's platforms. And, I, and I'm excited to see that the industry is embracing working together 
uh, especially of this new IP protocol that would allow all these devices to mm -hmm. talk to each other, make it easier for the consumer. Gotcha, and in terms of making it easier for consumers, I think uh, the smart home market has exploded in the last several years, but there's a lot of folks out there who are still you know, relatively unaware of some of the benefits of the technology. There's, there's, a, there's a barrier to entry because it's a little bit complicated, right? Like how, how have you kind of worked to, to lower those barriers and make things actually easier for folks to adopt? I think, I think Kate bringing the, the August lock to Europe and this new Yale Linus smart lock, I think she's working very hard to make it very easy for people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a big barrier has really been about setting it up, installing right. it. Because yeah. I, think, I think it's quite scary for some people. You know, they don't really think about changing their security very much. Mm -hmm. And so we've done, a, I think, a very good job on making that simple. But I think it's also about the value. So increasingly, people want to get in and out of their home in a different way. You want to give access to somebody for a short period of time or not. So trusted parties is becoming a big deal. So we have a number of pilots now in Europe where we're actually letting um, grocers or postal companies come into your home, drop something off and go. You know, if you maybe have a cleaner or a, a dog sitter that you want to give quick access to and then, and, and then leave. Before now, having the key is kind of seems very outdated. And yeah, I think yeah. the next generation want to have a smart door with a smart lock that you can control from anywhere in the world, and, and that's what we've done now. Yeah, I know. I've, I've been writing about the idea that like the keys, your wallet, and your phone are the three things you can't leave your house without, and I, I can't wait for a time where it's really just my phone. Like We're almost there with the wallet, but with the key, I still have to carry a key. And I live in a co-op, so they won't let me I, pull one of these things in. I do have a question about um, a, a trend we always see written about a lot, uh, how the younger generation can't afford to buy a home and we're renting more. Mm -hmm. I know I still rent. Uh, so uh, it, how does that impact your business model when mm -hmm. you have more uh, people who are in their 30s and want to get into smart technology, but they're like, hey, I rent. I'm not going to mess around with my yeah, door. Absolutely. So. You know, we, we make full replacement locks under our Yale brand. We make some really great full locks. But if you're if just renting, you don't want to replace an entire door lock. In fact, you might not be able to. Like your landlord may say, hey, like, you can't touch the lock. This is my building. And this is, this is really the, the magic of the August Smart Lock and, and now the, the Yale Linus Lock is that it, it's on the inside of the door only. So the outside of the door, the lock itself stays the same. So your landlord can still use their key to get in to repair things. And then you have really, these are really robots that are on the inside of the door that allows you to control the, the lock with your phone without actually changing the lock. And that helps when you're renting to just install this, it takes 10 minutes. When you move out, you take it off, take it with you. Okay. Yeah, and I think you're right with the, the next generation. They they just find the key very troublesome and, and very restrictive. Now, wherever they are, they can let some, someone in um, real time. And yeah. then you can, you know, work the way you want with your, with your home. And I think that the generation coming through have a very different relationship with their home. And I think this product will, will be great for them. So, Well, thank you very much, guys, for stopping by and showing us the new products. I really appreciate it. Um, we are going to wrap it now for the Daily Charge. I'm Bridget Carey. And I'm Roger Chang. But we're not done with CES because we're just getting started at our coverage of day two of CES 2020.